Welcome back to AP Statistics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Koken. We're going to be talking about section 6.3, which is all about binomial and geometric random variables. After this section, we'll be able to determine whether the conditions for a binomial distribution and or, I should say, or a geometric distribution have been met. We'll be able to calculate and interpret the probabilities associated with both binomial random variables and geometric random variables, and we'll also be able to calculate the mean and standard deviation of both of those distributions and interpret them in context. Pause the video now so you can read about what a binomial setting is. As you can see from the definition, we have some specific requirements. Number one, it, there has to be a way that we can define both success or failure. And success, maybe if I'm rolling a die, a fair die, and I say the probability of getting a four and that's what I define as success is going to be one-sixth. Then the probability of failure could be one minus one-sixth or five-sixths. And that, would, that event would be the probability or the, the event of getting anything other than a four. We also need a specific requirement of independence. And that means that all the trials are independent. They don't have an impact on any of the other trials. The next requirement is that there's a specific number of trials. So for example, if I were going to roll that die, I might say I'm going to roll it five times. So my n or my number of trials is equal to five. And the probability of success must be consistent for every trial. Those are the requirements and you can remember them through these BINS initials and that's for binomial. Binomial starts with BIN. And this starts with BIN, so it's a great way to remember. Now, we can have a probability distribution of a binomial random variable, just like we've had for other random variables. It just so happens the binomial random variable is a discrete, not continuous, it's a discrete random, variables, random variable, which means it has to do with the count rather than the measurement of a numerical variable. And again, we're going to define the parameters of this binomial distribution with n as the number of trials, p as the probability of success, and then the specific value that we're interested in we're going to call x, which is our random variable. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. Pause the video now and read the example that starts on page 385. All right, so we know we're interested in, as success, having blood type of O. And this family has five children, so that's our number of trials, is five. We're interested in when we have exactly two out of the five children having blood type O. So let's calculate the probability for exactly two children having blood type O. So here you can see we've had probability of success, success, fail, fail, fail. And numerically, we multiply the probability of each of the different children having blood type O. So we have two successes, so it's 0.25 squared, and three failures, or children with blood type other than O, so it's 0.75 cubed. That gives us the probability, but it only gives us a probability for one time that that happens. And we know that that can happen in a lot of different ways. How many different ways can that happen? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So ten different ways that that could happen. So what that means is when we calculate the probability of exactly two children having blood type O, we're going to need to multiply the probability that we've already calculated by the number ten. What this is called, that ten is called the binomial coefficient. And this is something that you probably remember from either pre-cal or Algebra 2 honors. And I don't know if Algebra 2 regular does it, but anyhow. So this is the number of ways that it can occur, that that particular uh, set of circumstances can occur. Combination of successes and failures. And if you think about it, this is a giant tree diagram that we've drawn, drawn out in the case of the blood types, we would have five different trials or five different branching off points. So we need to know this number. We can calculate the probability of success and the probability of failure. We can raise it to the number, the power, that each one occurs, but we really need to know how many different ways that can occur each time. And for that, as we said, we use the binomial coefficient. You may remember the binomial coefficient as this n choose k, which is equal to n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. 
And in the example that we just talked about, we would have n factorial, meaning the number of trials, so 5 factorial, divided by 2, because we're, we're interested in exactly two children having blood type O, times 3 factorial, 5 minus 2. Okay, so that, you can see things will cancel out. There's also a calculator feature that you can use under your math button to do that. But what this is going to allow us to do is calculate binomial probabilities. And we're going to multiply, we're going to use this formula. By the way, I believe this is on your formula sheet. So we're going to multiply the number of ways that we can have the number of successes that we're interested in multiplied by the probability of success raised to the power of however many times we are interested in multiplied by the probability of failure times the power of whatever's left over. Okay, so let's again take a look at that example that that was about the blood types. And this time what we're going to see is, and again, the continuation of this is on page 388 in your textbook. So this time what we're interested in is exactly three children having type O blood. And we're going to do the n choose k. So we still have five children in the family. This time we're interested in three having blood type O multiplied by the probability of success, 0.25 to the third power multiplied by the probability of failure multiplied or raised to the second power. And we get the probability of exactly three in any arrangement. Now, second part of this question is should the parents be surprised if more than three of their children have type O blood? And remember, what we're interested in here is how likely or unlikely. If we talk about the word surprised or suspicious in one of these problems, that's what we're interested in. How uncommon or common is this occurrence? And in this case, what we need to do is find what the probability is of x being larger than 3, or either 4 or 5 of the 5 children having blood type O. So we calculate that probability, and we see that that would only occur about 1.5% of the time, maybe 1.6 if we use proper rounding rules. So that's not very likely to happen, and so the parents should be surprised if that occurs. Calculating the mean and the standard deviation of a binomial distribution is similar to the way that we've calculated it in the past. And when I say that, I'm looking, talking about section 6.1 where we had discrete random variables and we used kind of a weighted average to calculate the mean. So once we calculate the mean and the standard deviation, we're also interested in the ideas that we've learned in chapter one with shape, center, and spread. And just a reminder, we can calculate the mean, but to calculate the standard deviation, we actually have to go through variance and then take the square root. Pause this video if you would like to write these down. Also, there's a way to calculate binomial probability when we're interested in an exact value like we just did in the previous example of blood type. And the calculator feature is shown on page 389 of your textbook. Okay. Okay, so we know that there's a long way to calculate the mean and standard deviation. We just saw it with this idea of weighted average, but there's a shorter way, thank goodness. And this is something that you'll find on your formula sheet. So go make a notation on your formula sheet that you have a way to calculate mean and standard deviation of a binomial random variable. And it's with these very, very basic formulas. Remember that idea of mean when we're talking about a random variable is really the expected value. Over the long term, what do we expect to happen? we would, over the long term, expect to see the average of that random variable distribution. And in order to calculate it, we use n times p. So the mean of the random variable x is the number of trials times the probability of success. When we talk about the standard deviation, we're going to be taking the square root of the variance. And the variance can be calculated by the number of trials times the probability of success times the probability of failure. Just a quick note, these are only, only, only for binomial distributions, not any other type of distribution. So be careful with that. Make sure before you use these formulas that it does meet the criteria for being a binomial distribution. There is an example in your textbook on page 392, and it's about bottled water versus tap water. You may want to stop the video right now so you can go and read the setup for this question. Okay, so you read about this AP statistics class that did an experiment trying to determine whether they could tell the difference between bottled water and tap water. What we're interested in doing now is calculating the mean and the standard deviation of the random variable. 
So we're going to pull out our formula that's on our formula sheet and what this means is over the long term we expect seven students out of the 21 or one-third to be able to guess correctly between bottled and tap. Now calculating the standard deviation we're going to pull out our formula also where the standard deviation is equal to the square root of n times p times what I sometimes refer to as q, the probability of failure. And what does this mean? You would interpret this as if we ran this experiment many, many times with groups of 21 students each time who were actually just guessing and could not actually tell the difference between bottled and tap, then we would have over the long run a correct, um, a, a difference between the mean of 7 and the actual value 2.16 times. Okay, let's talk about binomial distributions in statistical sampling. And what we're going for now is this whole idea of inference. We're interested in inference. And what we're going to do is read the example about the CDs. And what I'd like you to do is pause the video right now and read the example that begins at the bottom of page 393, choosing a simple random sample of CDs. Okay, so you saw that sometimes, even though it seems binomial, it's really not officially, strictly speaking, because the probabilities change slightly. Now, if we calculated the actual probability of this situation, you can see what we get, 3, 4, 8, 5. But if we use binomial distribution to calculate it, we get a really close number. It's not far away. So what we've decided in statistics is that if if we have a sample size that's no larger than 10% of the parent population, we're going to be able to use the binomial distribution as an approximation. Okay? And formally with symbols we say that when we're using this sampling without replacement condition, we need to follow this rule of thumb that the sample size has to be less than or equal to one-tenth of the parent population. Okay, so there's another approximation that goes on, and that is sometimes the binomial distribution numbers, the trial numbers or number of trials gets larger and larger and larger. So I want you to just take a look and see what you think appears to be happening. That's right, you guessed it. It's starting to look more and more normal. It didn't really start out looking normal, but by the time we get to a population or a sample size of 50 or trial number, number of trials 50, we end up having what looks almost like a normal distribution. So what we're going to do is we're going to use normal procedures, so z-scores, in order to calculate the values for binomial distributions. This will occur when the number, the expected number of successes and the expected number of failures is going to be 10 or larger. This is going to be a condition just like the one that we talked about a few minutes ago with the sample size being no larger than one-tenth of the population size. Both of these conditions we're going to continue to use through the remainder of the year. So you definitely want to make a note of them and find them on your formula sheet. We're going to continue this lesson on another video, but we'll finish binomial before we switch over to the other video. So pause now and read the example on page 396. As you can see, this is all about shopping. And what our first job is to determine that this is approximately a random variable. So what we're going to do is use our bins and make sure that it is. And it is close. Then we're going to check the conditions for using a normal approximation. This means we're going to multiply n times p and n times q, or 1 minus p, and make sure that both of those values are 10 or larger. And they are. Now we want to know if we can use the normal approximation. And what we have to do here or, I'm sorry, we're going to use the normal approximation. So we're going to use the formulas that we just, we just uh, were introduced to for mean and standard deviation. And then we're going to plug those into a z-score. And that's going to be our standard deviation for the distribution. Okay, we're ready to start geometric, so you can finish up your notes, and I'll see you in a few minutes on the next video.